Hello, 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 and welcome. Uh, this session is about managing Kubernetes with Istio. Uh, if you do not know what Istio is, then this is a good session for you because I will try to go over what Istio is in this session. And by the end of it, you should at least uh, know something about why we should care about Istio and what it is and how does it help manage Kubernetes. So before we get started, I would like to get a quick level set with everyone. Again, in a live session, I probably would have asked and you would have raised your hand. I would know exactly. But in this session, just like nod with me if you are in agreement. Um, I will, I will, I'll get the feeling, hopefully. So first of all, we are moving, the, as an industry, slowly moving away from monoliths to microservices. There are certain benefits from uh, we get out of running our application in a microservice architecture. Uh, the soon, as soon as you go there, you start figuring out that running microservices on VMs is not a fun exercise for anyone. So packaging them in containers is actually a much better way to do it, where you can run your containers pretty easily. But the moment you go there, now the struggle is you have a lot of these containers. Now you don't know exactly when they're starting, when they're stopping, how do you make sure they're spinning up at the right place? So the idea of container orchestration becomes really valuable at that point. And back in 2016, 2017, you had this big war happening in the container orchestration space. We had Mesos, Docker Swarm, Kubernetes. Uh, but now in 2020, if you're building an application and you're trying to choose a container orchestration, more than likely you're probably going with something like Kubernetes or something beyond like OpenShift uh, that is an enterprise version for Kubernetes, uh, distribution for Kubernetes. So these are kind of like vocabularies we're going to need to understand the next bit of conversation we're going to have. But first, uh, what are you going to learn today? We're going to learn what a service mesh is, why does Kubernetes need a service mesh, and finally, how Istio helped manage Kubernetes. Uh, my name is Mofi. I'm a developer advocate at IBM. I, as, as, I, as I said earlier, I collect stickers. I also do a lot of container stuff and write Go code. I could be found anywhere on the internet at MofiCodes. Twitter, YouTube, Twitch, Dev, Medium, you name it, I'm at Puffy Codes, hopefully. Um, so yeah, find me there. If you have any more conversation, you want to just chat, talk about how Kubernetes is great or Kubernetes is terrible, I'm, I'm op open to hearing both. So let me start this talk officially by saying Kubernetes is a great tool. And it is great because it comes pre-bundled with all these things out of the box, right? A lot of us were building these things for our system uh, just, and we're building this in-house tools to get these features. But Kubernetes, the moment you go to Kubernetes, you have these things out of the box. Then why this talk, right? If Kubernetes is so great, why can't we just like be on Kubernetes and be happy with ourselves? Well, Kubernetes is a platform for building platforms. It's a better place to start, not the end game. And Kelsey Hightower himself said so, so it must be, must be true. Let's just... Take a step back now and think about where we came from and how we got here. So if you are were building a monolith or are still building a monolith, this is probably an architecture you're all too familiar with. You have your user talking to your application, which maybe or maybe not talking to a database. But in most cases, in reality, what is happening is you have this application which does 18 different things into this one giant code base. You're probably talking to seven or eight different databases at that point. And it gets very difficult to manage. No one wants to touch that code base because any change in that code base means you have to go through this giant process of testing everything again, making sure everything works with that one line of change you made in some part of this application. So it was a logical thing to do where people uh, broke their application into microservices, put an API gateway on top, have some databases talking to each other, or then you have some message queues to talk between services. So it was life was good, and you moved to containers, went to Kubernetes. Well, what I'm claiming today is that Kubernetes on its own is not enough. Um, why do I say that? It's because we are no longer building our application. For most cases, we're not no longer building application for just our data center. We are building application as to be cloud native. And what it means to be cloud native is that it runs on cloud as a first class citizen. We build application knowing that our application wouldn't be running in an environment that we control fully, it's gonna run in someone else's computer. So what do we need? Uh, we need things like traffic management. We want to move fast. We want to be able to send people to a different version of application if I'm changing my application. I don't want to all of a sudden cut off my application to a new version. I want to slowly route my traffic to a new version. 
Uh, I want to be able to control and make sure people that I want to see a version of my application gets to see that version with some logic. We can say things like new users see this version of the application or people who have turned on experimental features see this application. So a lot of fine grained control we want to have on our application. We want to know what's happening. Uh, in, in, in the monolith world, your application was this one giant binary and you could just look at the log of this application to know what's going on. But now you have these microservices running all over the place and having a proper observability tool lets you know when something or some, something is going wrong. Uh, then you need to, again, in a monolith application, you could have just set a policy that was across the entire application, but now you have 20, 30, 40 microservice and asking each developing, development team who might be writing this application in multiple different languages to enable this company-wide uh, policy is actually quite difficult. So you need to have a way to enforce policy against all your services. And finally, the forgotten child of computers, security. Uh, we need to have a way to uh, secure our application. Now, going to container, you get some level of isolation just because your containers are, uh, you have a smaller surface of attack. At the same time, now your clusters are in the public domain and the public cloud. Now you have to think about security a little bit different way than rather than saying, I'm gonna have a firewall in my data center and we're good to go. We're just, we're gonna call it a day. Uh, so what do we need to do, right? We need ingress and traffic management. We can use something like Nginx for it to get, to get a load balancing happening. There are other tools, but this is a good start. For tracing and observability, you can use open tracing tools, metrics and analytics, you can use Prometheus. For identity and services, we can use something like Vault to get our secret pass to our application. So these are tools that we can, make use of, that's not bad. But if you were to look at this particular image, that is the current DNC of landscape. Uh, the, this picture was uh, taken about, about two days ago. So it's pretty recent. And if you can't read the names of any of those small tiles, is because there are way too many of them. And there are tools, they're mostly open source tools. There are a lot more proprietary tools uh, outside this list as well. So anything you want to do, for example, storage, runtime, security, we have tons of tool. What do you choose, right? How do you choose which one to use? How do you figure out what do you need? Um, so that's a lot of work for development team. First, you gotta manage Kubernetes. You gotta do deal with Kubernetes stuff. Then you gotta now figure out, I'm telling you that you gotta figure out four plus third party tools. This doesn't seem right to me, honestly, because Kubernetes was supposed to be this great thing that was solving all our problems, but all of a sudden I'm telling you that, yeah, Kubernetes, going to Kubernetes, you are just gonna invent more work for yourself. So what do we do? Um, option one, which I like quite a lot, is give up, is say, you know what? We have tried Kubernetes, it was the greatest thing. It was an open source project, came out of Google, so it was probably really good, but you know what? It, it didn't solve all our problem. Life wasn't as great as we thought. So we're gonna just sit in this fire that we created for ourselves and maybe have some s'mores. Um, well, we're problem solvers. Our companies pay us so that we can solve their problems. And that's where option two comes in, right? Manage it all. We can manage everything. We can manage Kubernetes. We can run all these other third party tools that we need to run. And it won't be the first time we do it. Uh, if you, we, recreate wheels all the time. Otherwise, there won't be so many different tools because we just recreate those tools. Sometimes those tools are really good, so we open source them. Um, so you remember this list, bunch of these things were being built as libraries or frameworks at a lot of different orgs, like over and over again. Most orgs that I personally know have solutions for doing that kind of things. So I don't think skill is the issue here, right? Given enough time, you can, build pretty much any tool you need to. But the problem is most development teams are responsible for a product, not building those other tools they need to build a product. So time is the issue, not skill. So option three, and what I'm proposing today for getting a lot, of out of, a lot out of your Kubernetes cluster is to use a service mesh. Now, at this point in my talk about halfway through, you might be wondering, what is the service mesh thing is this guy keeps on talking about? And you might be right, and you, I haven't talked about what it is yet, so let's talk about it. Service mesh is collection of best-in-class solutions, which lets you control and monitor service-to-service -service traffic. 
and that's the official definition of a service mesh is. But after about two, about three years of service mesh being around, uh, it has taken a lot more work on itself uh, since then. So invisible to the dev team, we, this is, I think, the best part about service meshes. If you are using a service mesh, your development team won't have to do anything different to take advantage of the, all the features service mesh comes with. So let's talk about Istio. Uh, Istio is one of the service meshes that is out there. It's one of the first service meshes to come out. Uh, it's an open source project from collaboration between Lyft, Google, and IBM. Uh, it started pretty much from Matt Klein open sourcing Envoy Proxy, and Istio uses Envoy Proxy underneath. So Istio has four main components. It has the Envoy Sidecar Proxy and Mixer, which does the enforcement of access and collecting met metrics. You have Pilot that propagates rules to sidecars, and Citadel that handles the security. Uh, the features of Istio include traffic management. It lets you do routing rules, detries, failover, and fault injection, and many other things. Observability lets you collect uh, metrics, logs, and trace, as well as um, include cluster ingress and egress. So not only you can get metrics from what is happening within your cluster, you can also get metrics from if you have applications talking outside your cluster, as well as applications trying to talk to your cluster. Uh, you also have for security, uh, authentication and authorization layer, and you can enable uh, MTLS between services, mutual TLS between services, as well as ingress and egress. Uh, for policy, you can set policy for um, any kind of policy defined with YAML, obviously with Kubernetes, to uh, handle access control and policy checks, things like, V1 versions can no longer talk to V2 versions, or V3 versions are uh, not allowed to talk in this region and all that. You can go really fine-grained with uh, this kind of policy enforcement. Uh, so how does it all work? So imagine, uh, or look, imagine a Kubernetes service where service A is trying to talk to service B. In Kubernetes world, service A would make a named HTTP call if they're in the same namespace like HTTP service B, and they would find each other. Uh, in Istio world, it changes a little bit. You have a proxy, which is a container on the same pod as the service A and service B. And anytime service A wants to make any network call, changing some IP table rules, the proxy can hijack that request and look at the request, what it's trying to do. So in that time, it can collect metrics about the request, as well as do some policy enforcement to see if service A is actually allowed to talk to service B. If it is, then it will talk to the proxy of service B, which will then pass that information back to service B. Uh, you can actually extend that into, uh, so that proxy to proxy communication can be done over HTTP, HTTP2, gRPC, TCP, and you can enable TLS optionally if you want to get the security enabled. So that is basically just magic, right? Like just how's that all, how does that even work? Um, well, all that is coming from the Envoy sidecar proxy that we talked about. It's a high performance proxy, uh, open source by Lyft, and it handle, mediates inbound and outbound traffic. And a lot of these features of Istio that we talk about actually come from this Envoy proxy. And this is a great example of Istio just making use of a best in class solution instead of reinventing the wheel themselves. Um, so let's continue talking about the architecture. Now, this is what is happening when you're talking to service service within the cluster. If you were to talk, like kind of extend it from egress and ingress, what well, this is what it would look like. You can have an ingress gateway that is like collecting metrics on requests coming from outside the cluster. You can optionally also have an egress gateway that collects metrics on application from your cluster talking to outside. So what this means is if service B wants to talk to an external service, let's say Google Maps, you could have an egress proxy that either allows it or says we, are, we don't talk to Google Maps, this is not a allowed thing in our applications, so you can block it from a, a, from a network layer uh, without having to enforce, like you can enforce this policy at a network layer. Uh, so it's the architecture. So this was the data plane where our application is running. Now let's talk about the control plane. So on the control plane, used to have three different services individually, Pilot, Mixer, and Citadel. But as of version 1.5, they have been consolidated into the STOD binary uh, just for saving some resources because speaking microservices chatter is pretty expensive and Istio wants to be as memory, like use memory efficient as possible. So they combined 
pilot mixer and set it all into his TOD, which still does the same thing, but just as a single binary now. So the pilot part of his TOD would be responsible for sending the config data to proxies. So whatever configuration you have for your cluster, we will be sending them to the uh, individual services. Then you have your uh, mixer that does the policy check. And finally, Citadel does the TLS search to the proxies. So traffic management, you can get integrated ingress and egress. You can do error handling, retries, and circuit breaking. And you can also use some application knowledge to leverage uh, intelligent routing. You can say, this particular user has a header that says it's experimental user. So I can send him to a route that is for experimental users and things like that. You could also do it based on browsers. So for example, if you want to say IE 11 users shouldn't be able to see newest version of my application just because it doesn't work there, probably doesn't. Uh, you can send them to a different version if you want to do that way. Also, you can inject fault just to test resiliency in your application. If you have a microservice architecture of 40 services, what happens if I inject a fault in the third layer? What happens to cascading failures to the rest of the application? You can do that kind of testing. Uh, there are some TRs, custom uh, resources in Kubernetes that allow you to do that. There's virtual service that allows to virtualize your service to do some versioning. You have destination rule. Uh, these are rules that are applied to your uh, route after the service virtual service routing has finished. Uh, then you have service entry that lets you enter your cluster from outside. You have gateway that works as a gate between ingress and egress. And finally, the idea of sidecar where you can run more than one container per pod. Um, so for telemetry, you have the mixer that collects the telemetry, and you have an idea of something called adapter that lets you take this metrics and send it to other places, things like cloud providers or Prometheus or Datadog, uh, SolarWinds, any kind of metrics collector that you have available. Um, okay, so next, so adapters lets you do that. You can write, even write, also write your own adapter if you want to send the data somewhere that doesn't already exist. Um, for performance and scalability, uh, this is lets you do end-to-end -end testing and benchmarks to make sure that your service to service, uh, as you're deploying new services, it doesn't regress, performance doesn't regress. Uh, for security, its traffic is encrypted uh, if you enable MTLS to uh, stop man in the middle attack. And this is one of the things that is quite difficult to grasp at the beginning because you would expect once something is within your cluster, it's a safe place to be, but what if one of your microservice, one of your containers gets corrupted uh, with MTLS enabled, now you can guarantee that that particular service won't be able to um, take down your other services by making a lot of um, just DDoS attack from within the cluster. Uh, you could also have policy that lets you control what service can talk to what service. So you can't have a random service all of a sudden going rogue and talk, trying to talk to every other service gather uh, information. Um, and it, of course, you have the auditing and metrics tool to collect information about if something is going wrong. The best way to solve a security bug is to make sure that doesn't happen in the first place. So installing Istio, uh, if you want to install Istio today, there are a few options. Number one is installing it manually by running the Istio's um, configs in YAML, which is probably not anyone would do today. And then you have the option of using Istio CPL which has a Helm-like API and uses Helm underneath to install Istio to any, any cluster. Then you have your operators. So if you're familiar with the operator framework, you can install Istio that way too. Uh, finally, you can get a managed Istio. So a bunch of the cloud providers actually have a managed Istio that uh, installs and manages and updates Istio for you, for your cloud provider. IBM Cloud has a managed Istio, and so does, uh, I think, uh, Oracle and Google. Cloud, where you can just click a button in your cluster and get Istio installed. And as, as a new version comes out, you can get update automatically uh, from there. So again, uh, so that's something we can do. And now let's see some demo, how we can manage Istio, uh, manage Kubernetes with Istio. All the code in this demo are available in this link. Um, I can share that link later as well, uh, but so, the application we're talking about, we created a, like a dummy travel application. So we have this, we called it B Travels, B, B double E. Um, and so you have this services running. We have five microservices, which is the app UI. Then you have your currency exchange, you have destination, you have a hotel and car rental. So this is V1, all the data is being stored on the container itself. As we move to V2, 
we no longer want to store data in the container. We have a Mongo database running in the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, so we can talk to that. Uh, we can get data from the Mongo database. And then for V3, it's still the same structure, but the, now we have a managed Mongo database. So the services differ how they get their data, right? So that's how the services differ. So let's take a look at what it looks like. So I have um, get PO, and I'm gonna get my pods. What pods are running, as you can see here, I have about what, one, two, three. I have for each of those services, I have three versions for car rental, destination, and hotel. And you will see here, I have two of two running. That basically means I have one container of my application and one cont container of the Envoy Sidecar proxy. Um, and then I also have the, all of them running right now. And I also have Istio installed. So K get service dash and Istio system. You would see that I have a bunch of Istio things running such as Grafana, KL. You'll look at that in a second. But the important thing here to see is the ingress, ingress gateway. That's where my application is being served. If I do K get VS, you will see I have a bunch of virtual services created and k get dr i will see i have a bunch of destination rules created so with all that my application is now alive and we can do things or look at what's happening in this application we'll come back to this page just in a second um okay so we are in this we're going to refer to this page that's what the ui looks like i can look for some location i'm in new york so i'm going to look for new york and so this is what it looks like but that's not interesting to me at least from a service point of view so we have another endpoint here that lets you look at the services as it is right now. So we have this UI service talking to this four other service and you can refer to this page. You'll continue to talk to V1 because that is the policy I have set up so far. Um, so if I were to K describe virtual service, you will see that all of my services are talking to the subset V1 right now, V1, 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 V1. And Kubernetes, prod, v travels, Istio. Okay, so we have all our. Um, so this is, this is the configuration that is set right now. We are setting the destination for all our services to go to v1. So let's try to send them to uh, equal weight. So what we're going to do is send apply this particular um, config that is going to send my traffic randomly to one of my three services between destination, hotel, uh, V1, and car rental V1, V2, V3. So I'm going to say, k okay, apply dash uh, f equal wait. So once I apply, and this is should be as quick as just applying that, all of a sudden you will see I'm going to start seeing between these three things, V1, V3, and V1, uh, just show up once every while. Again, the application itself shouldn't function any differently, but we are seeing a different version here. Okay, so that is uh, quite simply the way to, you, you can easily change your traffic going to a different version there. Um, let's see what else can we do here. So cat is the equal weights wasn't good. Uh, let's see if we can inject some delays. Uh, okay. So we want to inject some delays, inject delay. So what we're gonna say is, okay, so if you try to refresh your page, we are gonna add a random delay of three seconds to my destination, two seconds to my hotel, and five seconds to my car rental. So if I were to go to my application and well, be on a page that is gonna be a little bit more easier to see. So I'm gonna apply this, okay, apply dash F, Istio inject delay. So we just injected delay here and going to come back and I'm going to refresh this page. Right away, you're going to see that destination loads up a couple of seconds later. These services haven't loaded up yet. Um, it's going to take more seconds. It's showed up. So what we can do with this is without changing my application code, I can now test what happens if one of my services is delayed by like 10 seconds. How do I mitigate that in my application? You can do this kind of testing extremely easily in uh, with Istio. Um, we can do other things. We can also inject some faults, like 500 errors. So inject faults. Uh, so this one, what I'm saying is, for car rental service, inject 500 if the browser is Chrome. For everyone else, just send them the application. For destination, send them 500 if the browser is Firefox. And for um, 
for destination, just send them V1. For hotel, send them 500 if the browser is Firefox. Okay, what does that look like? So, okay, apply dash F, Istio, inject fault. Again, I'm gonna apply this right away. The change was done. I'm refreshing the page. I should see that I don't no longer see the car rental service. I only see the hotel service. If I were to go open it up in a Firefox browser and refresh this page, you'd see I only see the car service now. And if I were to open this up in a Safari browser and try to look for New York, I should see that in Safari browsers, I see both my hotel and car rental service, right? Um, so again, this is a very convoluted example of what it does, but it can show the power and you can already start thinking about how you can control and uh, contort your services to test different configurations. How does your UI handle one service not show up, showing up? How does your uh, architecture handles one service is not just working or returning 500 errors? Okay, so what else can we do? We can, uh, so in most cases, you want to, when you're doing a deployment, you are probably doing something like a blue green deployment from one version to the next version. You can do something very similar with that. Okay, apply dash F, uh, Istio. Uh, you can do virtual service uh, 50 V1 to V3. So, what am I saying on this one is, okay, okay Istio virtual service 50. Okay, so what am I saying here is send 50% of my traffic to V1 and 50% to V3. And for each of my hotel, car rental, and uh, destination services, if I were to, apply, after I applied it, if I were to look at my, uh, okay, if I were to look at the service graph here, you'd see only, th these three services would only show V1 and V3. So I can just refresh this page a few times, you'll see that V1 and v only V1 and V3 show up here, V2 doesn't. Uh, or if you're happy with V3 and V3 is working as intended, we could just send all my traffic to virtual service all V3. And all of a sudden, if I just come back and refresh this page, I'll start seeing all of my services are going to V3. Sometimes if I'm, okay, I didn't, oh, I, did, I didn't apply, I just did a cat. That was my mistake. I have to do all V3. And this happens at the network layer and it happens super fast. Like I have, tried to come back really quickly to catch it in the change, but I usually can because it happens in milliseconds. Okay, so let's look at, so this was how to control your traffic routing. Let's look at how to know more information about what's happening in your cluster. So here I have Jaeger and uh, Grafana and Kiali running. So I'm going to, Grafana died, so I'm gonna start it again. And so I have Jaeger, Kiali and Grafana. So these tools are a great way to know what's happening in your cluster. So you have this Istio dashboard, where now I'm generating some traffic off the screen as well here using uh, artillery to send some traffic here. Oh, I need to make some more. Like if I say uh, artillery run artillery.yaml, this will just generate a bunch of traffic randomly to my sub services and we can start seeing them show up here. But this is a great way to know that your services are doing well, they're 100% success. If it fails at any point, you will start seeing, you can set up also alerting and monitoring that sends you Slack message, email, see calls your home, whatever you want to do uh, with that situation. I, that's, uh, that's Grafana that works with Prometheus to get the metrics. You also have Jaeger here where you can, uh, let's say for hotel, I want to know, okay, so this failed to fetch. Oh well, uh, we, well, live demo, right? So something is going wrong in our Kiali dashboard here. We can come take a look here. So here we're trying to talk to our car rental and hotel services. We're seeing some reds and we need to figure out why that is happening. But um, so you have your Kiali dashboard as well that lets you look at your cluster from a top view any given time. You can look at the entire structure of your microservices and then uh, try to figure out exactly how your services are talking to each other. Um, so if I were to zoom in, this is my meshed service, and you can now see that BEY is talking to these three services. And this green arrow basically means it the moment it collected the data that at the time we were only talking to V1 and V3. So V2 services are not being talked to. You can also see that my V3 services are talking to something called the pass-through cluster. This basically means it's making an external call. Um, you could also so from this, we know that V3 services are talking to something outside. 
and we can investigate whether or not we want to allow that talking outside thing to happen. So that's all I probably have time to show you uh, as some closing remarks. Number one is there are no free lunch lunches in this world, right? Like we're getting all these features out of Istio that basically means we need to spend some resources to run it. Um, as of now, Istio team is working very hard to make that resource consumption very low. For a thousand requests per second, I think Istio uses about half a CPU and 1.5 gigs of RAM. You can get more information on istio.io to learn more. So takeaway, service mesh extends Kubernetes capabilities. It can make some very difficult Kubernetes things easier. And how would you go use it? It's kind of up to you, but I'm here to say there is another option with service meshes that you can take advantage of if just managing Kubernetes everything yourself seems difficult. And finally, thank you. And thank you to the organizers for having this con conference. I know it has been one of the hardest thing to have to re reschedule and then kind of reassign everything to go online. But with the situation of the world, that's the best I think we could have done. And the conference so far looks great. And yeah, really, really happy that this week you guys could make it happen. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. I would like to hear more about like your stories, your difficulty, or your uh, you know war stories about Kubernetes or service mesh if there is any. And you can find me online later at Movicodes. You can also shoot me an email at movicodes.ibm.com if you want to. Yeah, so that's pretty much it. And if you have any question, if the organizers will let me know, I can try to answer a couple in the last few minutes.